You're listening to the Fusion Patrol Podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of Fusion Patrol. I'm Eugene. And I'm Ben. And we'd like to welcome a special guest tonight. We've got David back on the podcast with us. Hi, thanks for having me back. Well, it's good to have you here, and uh, you're just in time to join us to be talking about episode two of the Star Lost. The exciting series, Star Lost. Yes, indeed. (laughs) It's everyone's favorite here at Fusion Patrol, I think. Right, Ben? No comment. (laughs) (laughs) Well, episode two is called Lazarus from the Mist. And uh, following on after the previous episode where our heroes discovered that they were aboard a giant space arc, in this episode, they decide that they need to find a way to save everyone. And so they go out hunting for information and they come across a cryogenic bank of frozen engineers, technicians, and other people considered crucial for uh, the continued functioning of the Ark, and necessary for when they arrive on the their planet that they're heading for. At the same time, a group of degenerate security guards, who've turned into a sort of stupid cannibals, are trying to cause them problems, and presumably eat them. And um, the story just goes on from there. So, uh, we'll, we'll give it to David, you haven't, uh, you didn't get a chance to talk with us about uh, the first episode of Star Lost. Uh, what are your thoughts uh, so far about uh, about this episode, and, and any specific ones you might have about the first episode, if you'd care to add them in? Well, uh, I had never seen the show before to begin with, but going into it now, you know, obviously, you know, the special effects, the acting, you know, it's, it's, what, it's a Canadian production from what, back in the early 70s. So. Yeah, I know <laughs> acting has advanced much since the 1970s. <laughs> exactly, and I think, you know, the the, the uh, chroma key or whatever kind of background special effects that they used were pretty weak. I mean, and this was definitely, I guess it was meant to be an adult show, right? Now, it wasn't a kid show, going by at least the way the storyline was going, I would assume. I could I could jump in there and say I guess it was meant to be a Canadian show, but I would I imagine <laughs> we would offend our Canadian listeners, and I don't wish to do that. Um, it, I don't know who this target. I think it was meant to be an adult show. I mean, adult as in the adult audience, not uh, the porn industry. Yeah, I mean, I think I, mean, I feel that the overall concept of the show it, it's an interesting storyline. I mean, if that was the show that they wanted to remake today, I would have an interest in seeing it. But uh, as as well as it was, as the way it was produced and directed, acted, and everything like that. I mean, just just watching it as the show that it really was. I don't know if people ha- could really have enjoyed it back then, because when you re-watch older shows from that time era, I mean, so many other shows st- seem to stand the test of time, and that one just is just so weak in any way, shape, or form. It didn't just stand. It not only did it not stand the test of time, it just didn't stand the test. Period. Why do you think <laughs> Harlan walked away from it? Yeah. Yes, but but we. I have been. Uh, we're now up to the third uh, edition of the comic book, which is recounting the first episode, which is the one he walked away from. And I haven't figured out what it is that's been changed significantly that would make oh, you're him kidding. go, "Ooh, I've got to leave now." This show's really fouled up my vision. So the only thing I can assume is that the f- the final part will have some dramatically different ending. Uh, yeah, it could be. But uh, right now, so far. You know the concept seems to be dead on with what he, with what he had. Um, yeah, and you were saying in your last podcast about the first episode of Star Lost, how you know Harlan won awards for the writing and everything, right? And, and it's like you know the comic is exactly the same as what we're seeing on the show, which is what got changed. That really doesn't make well, you wonder. Exact isn't quite the right word for it, but I'm. But you know they they've got a grander scale in the comic book. They can be wearing spacesuits and they can be, you know, walk into decks that have open windows and the computer technology is a lot uh, more. But but as a lo- as a whole, the comic is still just, you know, mustache. Oh, in the comic, he doesn't have a mustache, so I guess I'll have to call him Devin. Um, <laughs> you know, mustache. Goes through the whole process of discovery and getting out and 
and is now being instructed by the ship that there's something wrong. And I mean, right down to the whole thing like, insert number 42 for information on the disaster. And it's like, it's missing. Oh, well, sorry. I mean, it, it really is, is. Anyhow, I guess that's, that's neither here nor there with, the, with the, uh, our second episode, which is quite the humdinger. Um, who wants to start? Ben? <laughs> oh, must I? <laughs> <laughs> yes. David's given some of his background opinion. Now you can, uh, now you can chip in with what you loved about this episode. Okay, I'll tell you exactly what I loved about this episode. The computer. What a hoot. <laughs> <laughs> May I be of assistance? <laughs> no, 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 no. I'll, there's, there's a wonderful scene. Is it where he's pointing? Yes. <laughs> there's this, for, for, for anybody who has not seen this episode, uh, and I'm sure that's you're, most everybody you're listening. Lucky. There is this one hysterical scene where he, the computer, he is it, giving directions to uh, Devin as to where to go. I, 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 it, it was so laughable. I can't even remember what he was pointing at. He just he said something like down the hallway. Yes. and then he pulls it in his hand and he's like. His hand comes that into the way. screen view and then points to his left that way. And it's just the funniest thing around. And then he does it a second time when he's talking to uh, a revived engineer. And he's telling the engineer to press the space bar. And you see a finger all of a sudden just pop up pointing towards what you think is a space bar. And, I, and, and all, all I can think of is, are the writers that dumb? Apparently so. Well, and there's also a sequence there where they say something to the effect of, to retrieve the information, key in the following sequence, 3752653478. And he punches it and he gets it wrong, and then the computer's like, (sighs) (laughs) 3752... The computer actually gets pissed off, and I thought that was great. I liked it. I mean, to me, that was the best part of the entire episode. They they should have given the computer an actual finger, and he could have just typed in the number himself, rather than read to them what they need to type so that he can tell them it just... <laughs> well, I was wondering from that particular scene is if maybe he's also a teaching computer for like younger kids when the, you know, the ship first went out there, maybe that's why that could, they were making mistakes and it was like a schooling kind of thing. That's not a bad idea. Yeah, it isn't a bad idea and it also explains why the art got blown up because if that was my teacher <laughs> <laughs> you know, we'd, we'd be screwed. We'd, we'd be in trouble. <laughs> that's what all we liked, right? Anybody like anything else? Not, not really. really. No. No. There, there's nothing really redeeming about this. I, I would have to say that the uh, guest actor, I can't think of his name, and I've seen him in lots of shows, he, he seemed to be a little a step up on the acting. Is that like Dr. Aaron? Yeah, yeah. Doctor. Yeah, or, or the leader of the Uggs. No, no Dr. Aaron. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, Converse? Frank Con- Not Frank. Yeah, that sounds right. Frank Converse? Yeah. I think that was the name. It's Converse. I think maybe Frank Converse is a football player, but. But yeah, Converse, and, and you've seen, and he's been in lots of other shows. He's a real guest. He's a real actor, unlike um, the rest of them. And he was, he was pretty good. So, uh, interesting thing. So they get into this room with engineers, and the computer tells them this room is filled with critical engineers whose knowledge is too valuable not to have aboard the Ark, and they're frozen in cryogenic suspension. And so. Um, and there's this other people. It's not just engineers. And so Devin asked the computer, are there any engineers? He said, there are 17 engineers. And I said, okay, what are their names? And the computer starts reading them off alphabetically. And he says, stop. Okay, give me the first one. Where is he? And so, okay, Dr. Aaron. And he sends him down the corridor with a pointy finger. And, and they revive him. And, but before they revive him, Drip, the girl says to Devon, do we have any right to revive him? I mean, they put him in here, and he's, you know, not expecting to get up until we arrive at the new planet, and uh, we don't have any right to do this. And and Devon kind of says, well, he's going to die if we don't take him out and they save the Ark. But still, do we have the right? 
like well, th- she this is the dumbest further. moral dilemma I've ever heard in my life. Well, she was it concerned is. about his psych, the, his psychological being as well. She thought, "Oh, he's been laying it for hundreds of years." Uh, How can we thinking after all that? Okay, actually, so she, still. she goes a little further than that in in where she actually says, "Isn't this something that should be left for the creator?" Yeah, well, of course they do come from Cypress Corner, and and you'd think that at this point they would have figured out that the creator is the people that made the ark. So, so here you got Rachel, who's completely falling back into a religious, relig- a religious stereotype, which I actually thought it just didn't didn't fit. Even though we're talking about uh, the next story, I mean, it, it's obviously consecutive in in this in this uh, big storyline. With everything that she's seen so far, with everything that she's come to understand, for her to fall back into that so rapidly. Well, she doesn't Towards strike Devin. me as being particularly uh, <clears throat> bright. But also, she also th- refers to him as being dead, bringing him back from the dead, which, of course, he's he's not really dead. She doesn't understand cryogenic suspension. Well, the description that the computer gave when Devin asked for a, a definition of it did seem a little bit dead-like. <laughs> Just... He's only a little dead. Yeah, I'm getting better. <laughs> He's only mostly dead. <laughs> I I was reminded nothing more than of, of the trolley tests in psychological exams, where you put the person on and you say, okay, here's your choice. There are five people tied to a train, a trolley track on one side, and you can't get to them and you can't save them, but you can, you can divert the train to another track but on the other track one person is tied to the track and that's your kid yeah well in some variations it is yeah there's there's several variations of it there's like the looping track where one track will first run over the guy and kill him but it gives you more time to get to the other family before it loops around and kills them or there's the one where would you push the guy off the bridge to land in front of the trolley to derail it so that you it saves the people, and uh, uh, it, you know these are interesting morality play or morality tests. But hers, to me, just rang so empty. It's like he's dead. He's guaranteed positively one hundred percent dead if you don't save the ark. And these are the people that they put on the ark mm-hmm. to make sure that nothing goes wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, how could you possibly have the slightest bit of qualms about at least trying? At least I'll give Devin some credit that he, he was able to explain it to her, but even then you could see that she still had the doubt. And, and then, I, yeah, and then they pull what has to be the dumbest thing in the episode. You can't get the guy's medical information until, <laughs> until after you revive revived him. him. Yeah, exactly. And it tells him, oh, by the way, he's going to die in two hours from an incurable disease. Yes, radiation virus. Radiation virus. I'm wondering, if he was critical to the ship when it arrives at the new planet, and they don't have a cure for radiation virus when they put him in, what makes them think they're going to have a cure for radiation virus when they pull him out the other end? It just, it's very poor writing. Yes. I'd say. Yeah, the charts should always be on the front there. And I mean, I mean he could have had a deadly disease that's going to be a virus that wipes out all humanity in five seconds, and they've got him in there, and you won't know that until you open it up. Whoops, too late, you know? It's, it's, yeah, that is kind of ridiculous. Yeah, you could be reviving typhoid Mary. I yeah. mean, what kind of a brilliant strategy is that? Yeah, it, it didn't seem very well thought out. But of course, by doing that, we get to, how do I say it, reaffirm Rachel's doubts about whether or not they should have opened him up. You know, it should be a no-brainer, and it was a no-brainer, and then they throw in this ridiculous plot point, and it's like, oh, well, darn. I Now I was right. We shouldn't have revived him. Well, I think this is a... a I think this is a case where maybe the writer was kind of working backwards, where he wanted to Through somehow a bottle of just- scotch. Well, yeah, he somehow wanted to justify Rachel's uh, her her reluctance and fear about 
uh, reviving any of the scientists, and then he kind of worked himself into a trap. So, oh, gee, well, how can I, how can I justify Rachel in this this religious nonsense that she's trapped? And how can I do that? Oh, well, I suppose if I write something stupid, or that I can justify it, or they just needed a way so that they could not have any engineers because the story would be over if they woke <laughs> all the people up in cryogenic suspension. Probably. Well, there, I mean, there were so many other ways they could have gone about that. I mean, as they were looking around, Devin said, you know, over half these pods are empty. And, I mean, there's so many things that they could have said or, or done. It, it's in, even, even if they found – well, even, even if the writer decided that he wanted the engineers to be revived through the course of the series, it still it, – it, it would have made for better writing than what, than what we were given. And you mentioned something. You mentioned that they were half empty. No, that half the pods were empty. Half the pods were empty, that's right. And he well, said that not, in the show. Isn't that ha- odd? Well, half of the pods were empty, that's right. Isn't that kind of odd? I mean, that, that doesn't go peculiar. anywhere. It doesn't go anywhere in this no, in they, the context. No, they leave it alone, and that's it. At least in this episode. I mean, I don't know if they're going to revisit it. I highly doubt it. That's, um, yeah, there's, it's a mystery for the, the story arc before they'd invented story arcs. So, um, music, did you like it? You know, I really didn't even notice it. You didn't yeah, hear it? I can't remember how it was, yeah. It, it, really? I, mean, it, I, I heard something in the background, but it was just Thought so was god-awful a, forgettable. A cat was being tortured. <laughs> yeah, it's got that wah-wah electric and then the, the ticky-tocky all the time. It was driving me nuts. I I honestly don't remember it. I uh, I that's that's how I You're bad so it lucky. must have been. You're both so lucky. Yeah, yeah. I didn't think of it as incidental music. If anything, it's just more background. You know, actually, I think David's right. I think to me, it, it served more as background noise. I should I should find some and call it up here just to make you guys listen to it. It's so. <laughs> no, you don't. You, it's you like really stabbing me in the ears every time it comes on. So, um, all right. They revive this guy, and uh, they find out he's going to die. But, stand-up guy that he is, he recognizes that uh, they got a real problem there if, he, uh, if the Ark crashes into a sun. So he is willing to do whatever it is he can to help. Which, you know, I think that's... I think that's probably what anybody would have done. Somehow I don't think anybody pulled out of cryogenic suspension would have gone, no, put me back in until we get there. You know, given, given the enormity of the circumstances. And, and he seems like he's going to be a really helpful guy. I mean, he knows how to make bombs out of anesthetic. Yeah, should we point out that uh, this, this gentleman uh, named Dr. Aaron was a communications engineer. Yeah. Well, that's what you get and, by picking them alphabetically. Right. And yet he he understood how to make anesthetic bombs. I was I was very impressed. They must have taught that in communication school. Yeah, tie a bunch of glow sticks together and there you go. That's right. <laughs> and and and, <laughs> and not to mention that, what exactly was the purpose of having anesthetic glow sticks? I mean, okay, ignoring the fact that they're glow sticks, but in other words, they had these vials of anesthetic that don't appear to be administrable in any way. And when they do administer them to the people, they only cause them to get groggy for a few moments. And and he even knows that. He says, this anesthetic will only last a few minutes. Like, what good is that anesthetic? Well, maybe in its gaseous form it might do that but maybe there's a special hypo that would allow them to uh, uh, actually inject it into the bloodstream where it will become more effective I know I'm, pl- I'm playing I'm you're, trying to justify you're trying to justify you're trying to justify of course the reason he needs the uh, hypo is because the degenerate descendants of the security people have captured long hair Oh, I think we need to kind of back up just a okay. hair and and actually explain what these people are and where they're hiding. Okay, go ahead. Well, it's as our uh, intrepid trio are traversing down some hallway, they come across this this group of people that that look 
they're, they're very savage like their their english has totally decayed they're wearing completely torn clothing um and they're in serious need of dental work and uh there there's one guy with some kind of a <laughs> what looks like some, some kind of a cap and um uh, and and an eye that he has on an, in an on an amulet hanging around his neck, which I thought was rather peculiar. And they're they're uh, accusing our our uh, little trio of of stealing and, and going into the forbidden place. Well, remember they're they're the descendants of the security crew. Well, we don't know that yet. We don't at that point. That's right. Not but. at this point. We don't know that who they really are. But the only thing that I kept coming back is. After how many years again has the Ark been drifting through space? Did we say 400? Something like that. Since 400. the accident. Since the accident. I, I have to kind of wonder how could this little community that these people have formed, I mean, how could it, been self, how, how could it be self-sustaining? They eat people. They eat each other? I, you, you notice that when they were checking out long hair, they were, you know, pinching for his meat. Boy, that sounds terrible. <laughs> well, but, if, okay, you know in, what I mean. Any, they were they were checking to see how much meat he had on his ribs and stuff. I mean, they were they were eyeing him up for dinner. But if they do indeed eat people, then the number of them that had to have been in existence when this whole new decayed society kind of started would have to be in, would have to be huge because after a period of four hundred years, they would have eaten each other to death. They would have eaten each other's faster than they could reproduce. Hey, there was all those half-empty cryogenic pods. Maybe they had frozen dinners. Oh, yum. I'll never eat <laughs> Stouffer's again. I don't think that's the case because they don't go in there, but... <laughs> True. <laughs> it's, it's but fun. I... Th- I that was really one of my big things is who, what, how, how could a, a group of these people actually survive? I mean, they have, they really have no serious concept of what food is. Uh, Devin has to kind of explain it to them. Well, he has to explain apples. Yeah. Yeah, because they, they didn't understand what sweetness was, how they could no. miss that, I don't know. You know, how would they know that they're missing the taste of an apple if they don't know what sweet is? They've never had it before. And they've never, and they, obviously they haven't traveled far out of their little area, because at one point Devin is trying to explain to them the the concept of a biosphere or where at least where they came from, and and they they have no idea. I mean, this is they have been living in this hallway mm-hmm. uh, for who knows how long now, and and it always kind of puzzled me that they could actually be still existing. After all that time, I mean, it, it's it's so, sociologically not possible for them to uh, sustain themselves in, in that manner. But be that as it may, they are got, there. They are there, and they're they are the plot complication for this story, and the dental complication. And, oh yeah, there was there was some <laughs> really gnarly teeth. Yeah, no showers, no water, or anything else for them either. Obviously. No, no, but the, the, luckily you don't have aroma vision through TV. No. <laughs> Not yet, but if the way things are going with 3D TV is going, it'll just be a matter of time before some idiot studio executive thinks that's a good idea, too. Well, they did used to have scratch and sniff in theaters years ago. Until they, until they wore all the padding off the arms of the chairs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But in any event, that's kind of the backstory on who these people are. And, and we do find out later in the episode, compliments of Dr. Aaron, that they are possibly, he surmises that they are the descendants of the vault guards because this, there, are, there are a series of vaults. And there was the cryogenic vault mm-hmm. where Dr. Aaron and some other important people have been sleeping in, and I guess that we find out there's a, an agricultural vault. There's all these different vaults. Right. Uh, we're not quite sure what, how far apart they're spaced on the ark, but that these guards, uh, I guess they, they decided to be fruitful and multiply, well, and then... gave birth to that. <laughs> well, they do capture Garth, our our long haired hero. And uh, they're going to kill him and eat him 
but they they never actually say they're going to eat him. But I mean, there's there's just no doubt in their behavior that they're they're going to eat him, and uh, they try to use him to bait the others out. But Doctor Aaron is too smart for him, and he gasses them, and they're able with to, glow sticks. With glow sticks. <laughs> I didn't think they had those glow sticks back back then. I thought they were a little bit newer than, uh, than early 70s. I but, remember glow sticks as far back as 1977. Well, that's still newer than this. But I, they're identical. I mean, they don't look any different from a glow stick today. I was, I was like, wow, there's a product that has not changed. Maybe Canada was ahead of America at that time. In glow sticks, glow stick yes. Technology. In television making, clearly not. Exactly. So, um, what else happens in this episode? They, uh, uh, Dr. Aaron finds out that his wife is dead. Yeah, all right. Apparently, fair she died of uh, radiation virus as well, only she chose not to go into cryo freeze. No, no, I think she. No, she. She didn't have the radiation virus. But she and, was dying. No, no, she was dying because the Earth blew up. That, that's well, what they were implying, that, that okay. she was going to die when the Earth died, and that he, so she still had some time left, but he didn't if they didn't freeze him. So they froze him, and then she begged to be frozen with him, but they wouldn't let her. Oh, and so she... Yeah, she was the expert engineer. That's what they actually needed at this point. Yeah, nuclear en- a <laughs> yeah. Nuclear, nuclear engineer. engineer. Which, well, you know, they probably need a communications guy. I mean, he's got to get on the radio and call to where? When they... I don't yeah. remember. But, of course, you know, I mean, other, other than, you know, Rachel having her whole issue about even bringing one person back to life. It's like, okay, Aaron's back. He has two hours. Say, Dr. Zachariah is the expert. He can fly us to safety. He doesn't have a, a, a disease that's going to kill him in two hours. Bring him back. You know, there wouldn't be a problem, but that it didn't do that either. No, they walk Well, well, well I wasn't going to get there that soon, but fine. <laughs> they walk away at the end of the episode with all the rest of the cryogenic people left alone. It's like, well, I guess we'll just go find something else. It's like, I'm sorry. Every last one of those people would be awake. If at first you don't succeed, walk away. Yeah. And that's really the crime of the... That's the crime of the scriptwriters. They didn't come up with a convincing reason why... Just because one guy was ill and was going to die... Well, they put him back in cryogenic suspension, so he didn't die. So it's not like he lost his life over this. He lost a, a lot of his time, but he didn't lose his life over it. And they just walk away. And, of course, the only reason they do that is because if they had pulled the engineers out, then if anybody was going to save the Ark, it was them. And that would take it away dramatically from our our three ignorant heroes. And Who are so ignorant that they don't even know how to do a proper computer search and at least ask, ask the computer, is there anyone uh, qualified uh, in terms of engineering is there anybody in here who isn't going to die in two hours if I take him out of cryogenic suspension? Oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if the computer didn't know that one. It's possible. It's possible. It could be HIPAA compliance. He's not allowed to have that information in a non-secured... Right. Uh, uh, well, a lot of his knowledge seems to be uh, saved off onto other cassettes, because even in the first episode, I think, they had to put cassettes in for all the information. So here he may not know all the individual people with their diseases until you pull the cassettes out. Is no, that because those cassettes happen stupid? to be with the yeah. patients in their cryo yeah. tubes. <laughs> Just the computer retrieval system that has to tell you to change a tape so it can tell you what's on the tape. Yeah. <laughs> There's something this, really meta about that. Yeah, it's as you know, bad as having to tell you which buttons to push. It was like... <laughs> it, it's like to understand recursion, you need to know recursion. And without it, you'll never know recursion. Right. Yes. I, it's it's ter- terrible writing. Although you you said that Doctor Aaron or uh, I, we're going to call him Frank Converse, uh, <laughs> if that is indeed his name, I'm sure it's Converse. His acting was pretty good, but it, at times didn't he seem kind of um, out of it? And I don't know whether I, I couldn't quite tell for sure if that was the effects of the cryogenics and that he was really doing a heck of a good acting job, or whether he just really was phoning it in it in in places. I mean, there are times when he seemed to forget his lines. And I couldn't tell if that was supposed to be him 
doing it or whether it was where he was just forgetting his lines. Yeah, it's well, hard to we, say. It's, yeah. it, it, it is very hard to say. Uh, there's a part of me that uh, that wants to say that he actually was. I mean, we have no idea what kind of production schedule, if any, uh, these people were working with. I mean, with standard television, they usually have several days of, of prep time. And I know that uh, with current television, even now, uh, actors have breaks. They have these periods where they can actually sit down and you know they know, okay, we're going to be doing this scene. So let me work on, you know, I'm going to be memorizing, you know, reviewing this part of my script. I, he probably didn't have that advantage given, given everything else that is wrong about the nature of this show and how it, was, how it was made. I wouldn't be surprised if he was just kind of thrown into the fire. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah, with the with the, the quality of the acting in, in both the episodes so far, I mean, it could be you know one take and that's it. That's what you got to take. That and that could ex- that could partially explain why the acting uh, of our three three primary characters is so poor as well. Although in the case of Drip and and Hair, I don't think there's anything that could have saved those two. But but Cara Delay is not necessarily a bad actor. I mean, he's a little stiff and a little wooden, but my God, this is this is the worse than any it's the worst thing i've ever seen him do and and he has a perpetual sort of big wide-eyed sort of i we really have no choice kind of breathless sort of delivery in a wooden sort of way yeah. that I, I don't know what he's supposed to be portraying at, at that point i mean is that supposed to be the the country rhubarb that makes it in the big city kind of well, uh, thing, or what? It's funny you should mention that. One of the things that I noticed at the very beginning of this episode, so, okay, we're going to jump a little, you know, back and forth here. One of the things that I noticed at the very opening, they have, they're, they're still on the bridge. Uh, this is where we left them at the end of the, end of the first episode. Mm-hmm. And... Garth is looking, you know, hair is looking extremely uneasy. He he he's being very very flipped out and still wants to go back home. But Devin and Rachel, in spite of the fact that they have now seen dead body, you know, or a skeleton uh on the floor, they're walking around with this almost stoned-like smile. I didn't want to faces. say stoned, but I, I yes, but you it nailed was. They, it. It's they stoned. Really, they really came across as stoned. I mean, like like they were on something, and it just it it, it really it did not ring ring right with me. It, it felt very very weird. And well, they were just, used they were used to uh, breathing the terraformed air in their particular pod. Maybe the the spaceship air is a little bit different. It makes them kind of it's always more like, pure. Yeah, <laughs> more different oxygen levels. Uh. <laughs> Okay, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> it's it's not uh, not the production crew supplying them with something. Yeah. No, but but I I would say that it's it's simply due to just some of the of the worst acting, and it, it's very possible that when this episode was made, and I'm I'm guessing here, that they really had no time to to kind of prep, or or even properly rehearse for the scene, and so they just kind of like you know emoted in whatever immediately came to their minds at the time. We're going to find out that this episode had a director who was one of those guys who absolutely made them take like 300 takes until he got it exactly the way <laughs> he wanted it, every nuance of the performance, and that they are actually doing you know, dead on what he wanted. Well, then we know who to go after, don't we? <laughs> so what else is there left in this episode? We've got the, the cannibals uh, that are ultimately befriended by our heroes by showing them kindness and pulling an arrow out of their leader's chest. And that was the whole point, of, like, even in the first episode, when Hare, you know, he came, he's walking out with a crossbow, which seemed kind of like an odd weapon for him to even have. I mean, in their particular farming-type world, I assume, what would the crossbow be for? Was it supposed to be a plot, yeah? Was it supposed to be a plot device just for the second episode so they could do that and, and save the guy? Well, he he does. Uh, I I know enough to say he carries that crossbow all the time. That's yeah, he is it, weapon it, man. He yeah he, he's he's he becomes sort of like like the guard. But good point. What did they need a crossbow for? Crossbow is a weapon to kill humans. 
And so at Grover's Corners, that's, you know, it's it's just like a handgun. Grover's Corners? Grover's Corners. <laughs> War of the Worlds all of a sudden. My Oops, God, sorry, Eugene. Cypress Corners. Cypress Corners. Uh, sorry, it was an H.G. Wells flashback there. Um, I've been reading H.G. Wells this week. And uh, <laughs> Cypress Corners. So, yeah, it's, it's just like a handgun. I mean, there are weapons that you make that have specific... And yes, you can use it for target practice, but it's really not designed. It's a it's a human well, killer. Remember why he had it with him in the first place when he left Cypress Corners? He was going hunting for Devin. Right. He was he was hunting he was hunting <laughs> stash. <laughs> Be very very quiet. What hunting mustaches? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'll have to cut a little of that laughter out just to just to make it seem sane. Um, <laughs> yeah, but but prior was, to that was, point, he, what did he, he need it for? Well, no, none. His his sole goal was to kill Devin and come you know, return to Cypress Corners with Rachel. So he had it. You know, he had that with him, with the goal of killing somebody. Right, but it was hanging on his wall. When Devin came over to visit him and say, you know, I'm sorry I had to speak out against you and, and because you know Rachel doesn't love you. And uh, long before ever that happened, he was hanging on his wall. So, I mean, he's had a crossbow. I mean, are we supposed to believe there are wolves or something in Cypress Corners that, that they might need to arm themselves with against? Um, that's a good point. That, that's a very good point. I, th- I think this is another one of those situations where... Um, the the writer. Well, no, that was Harlan. That that that's all Harlan's doing. Is it okay? So let me ask you this, Eugene. Since you've since you've been reading the the graphic novel, uh, does Garth have a crossbow in the graphic novel? Okay, I'm through the third part of the uh, of of a four part. It's four parts, right, David? At least they, they haven't officially given an if it's going to be limited or not, or how far it's going to go. Oh, okay. I, I thought I'd read somewhere it was a four-part adaptation of the original. Uh, they're at part four, and Devin has just now returned to Cypress Corners to warn them that he's learned about the outside world. So, I mean, he's nothing's happened yet. I mean, he's been ostracized by the old folks, and then he's escaped into the outside, and the computer has instructed him about, you're on a ship, and we're going to crash, and this stuff. And then he goes back. So we really haven't, we've only seen Devin briefly at the crowd scene at the beginning, where they were talking about him and Rachel getting married. You mean Garth? Yeah. Devin, Rachel, Garth, long hair. It's not confusing, is it, when I just pick different names, like Grover's Corners and stuff to people? <laughs> Because, I mean, I could try to stick with their real names, if that would help, if, if anybody would care to... Well, next opinion. thing you know, we're going to be saying that, uh, that, that Star Loss was written by Harlan G. Ellison. <laughs> <laughs> yes, anyway, so, um, uh, so uh, Bedford goes... No, not Bedford. Um, <laughs> we, oh, we're having too much fun with this one. <laughs> So basically, the, the, we did see a scene in the comic book where uh, Devin and Garth, or Garth and Devin, if you want to interchange their names, um, are in his blacksmith shop. But I don't believe that the uh, that there's a crossbow on the wall in that one. Uh, so no, but they, they, he obviously hasn't gone after him yet. So uh, the only reason I'm, I was wondering about that is it's it's possible that when this was. I mean, I have no idea how much adaptation this story received uh, in terms of screenwriting for, for, for television. How much of Harlan's original, you know, well, from what you tell me, much of Harlan's story is, is still there. But maybe this is something that the director said, you know, we need a crossbow. We need, we need Garth to have a weapon. Hey, let's just plaster it up there on the wall, you know, bad directorial ideas. Okay, I just, just, uh, Flipped open uh, uh, number one of Harlan Ellison's Phoenix Without Ashes, and there indeed is the crossbow on the wall of Garth's house. 
or black sweatshop. Okay, so it's so uh, so Harlan must know something that we don't. Well, I should hope that the guy writing it has a good, clear vision of where he was going with it. But it's also the fact that the people drawing, the artists of the comic book, may have watched the TV series and are influenced by that as well. well so, until, so. so until we actually see the crossbow in action in you know in the comic, it's hard to say. Well, if the if this if this uh, is only going to be covering uh, the the pilot, then odds are no, we're not going to see the crossbow in action whatsoever. I was kind of thinking. I could be totally wrong here, because I, I really don't know what happens in Phoenix Without Ashes. I was thinking that the ending is going to have to be so dramatically different from the the pilot. Like, Devon, in an act of revenge, jettisons their biodome into space, and Cypress Corners is no more. Or something, you know, kind of petty like that. That, that, would, that, that I could see how a studio executive would go, well, I don't think we want our hero to be a mass murderer. Kind of thing. <laughs> no, I could see Harlan doing that, though. But I could see Harlan doing that. That's true. Because, well, he has And no for mouth all those people who scream. are wondering who we're talking about, we're talking about Harlan Ellison, the famous writer. Is there another Harlan? Not really. No, he, but, but he just... He owns that name. Yeah. Right. They capture the... Well, we don't care. We don't care about those details. Basically, they make friends with the cannibals because they, uh, they save the head cannibal's life. Uh, they, in fact, the, the the cannibal people actually shot him with Garth's stolen crossbow by mistake. And then our heroes pluck the, the bolt out and, uh, and bandage him up. And because of that, they good people. We friends now. And so because of that, then Dr. Aaron's last thing is, oh, by the way, there's a dome down the street nobody's using. Why don't you take them down there and feed them some apples? It's a, it's, I think it's the agricultural vault. But it looks more like a, it looks more like a biosphere. He, it, 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 is a, it is one of the biodomes. He says that it's, it's a, uh, I think he said they used it for retired bridge officers or something. So a recreation dome. But it is an, agri, it is an agricultural biodome. Similar to Cypress Corners. So, yeah, glad they had an extra. And yeah, and then they closed it up for those guys. That's where they're going to live now, and, and that's it. Yep. Yeah, and then all of a sudden I started having visions of space seed running through my mind. <clears throat> it, it was kind of, uh, it's like, okay, that dome has been running clear forever. You know, nobody's in there. It's not doing anything as far as we know. It isn't overgrown. The grass doesn't need cutting. The trees yeah, are all how, in that how shape. are all those plants being maintained? Are there little robots, Huey, Dewey, and Louie, that are taking care of it? Well, I, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the landscaping, I don't know. I think we can safely guess that there's rain, you know, artificial rain, and that the biodomes themselves sustain themselves in a natural, earth-like way without human intervention. But they work rather neatly trimmed yeah all everything was neatly maintained i mean it's it's it, it wouldn't look like that after 400 years so again here we're in a situation where there's some very very bad writing and i'm thinking that if you took a group of people who've lived in a corridor their entire lives and you threw them into a big agrodome and sealed them in i'm pretty much sure that within six months they'll be dead all of them Mm-hmm. Yeah, they won't know what to do with themselves, and it's like it's gonna be all open, probably fresher air, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then when it, when it rains the first time, well, are they gonna know what that is? You know, if they've been living in the walls the whole time, they may not even recognize the water and pouring down on them. Well, the leader's got that nice helmet, so yeah. so yeah, <laughs> that'll keep the rain off his 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 ears. And so our heroes walk off, dejected that they have that they've lost out their opportunity to save the Ark, but at the same time, gladdened that they've improved the lives of some of the people who are barreling towards their death. And they've been given a little bit of knowledge by Dr. Aaron that there's probably some books and stuff floating around somewhere in some of the domes. You have to find those and, and learn from them. Do you really think that if those three people found a book on nuclear engineering, that it'd do the slightest bit of good. 
Not a chance. Nope, no clue. No, no, I'd be waking up more people. Uh Uh-huh. Well, David said there was no way that we could talk more than 10 minutes about this episode. <laughs> before we should we started. point out that, okay, so, so Eugene, why is it that we're now talking about Star Lost? How is it that, that you came in possession oh, of yes. these episodes? Yes, yes. I thought that we should point that out, and perhaps you will understand why David is guesting on it. It's not because David runs a comic book store, and he's an expert on the comic books. Oh, no. David's the person who gave me the Star Lost DVD set. And you're very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and that is why we had David watch them. Yes. Yep. yes. Watch some of them. Here you go. <laughs> it's like, now it's your turn. Well, the show was legendary and never, very rarely seen. I, mean, I guess you had seen it, Ben, going by the, on the last podcast you saw. I think you said you saw it when you were young. but Yes, I, yeah. I, I saw it when it was in syndication. I only Much know about horror. it. I only knew about it from the Starlog episode guide books that they used to put out. I'm, I think it was in a Starlog edition Probably. as well. You know, they used to do the episode. Maybe they still do. Is Starlog even still around, David? No, that, that went defunct a couple years ago. Oh, it's did it really? Still, it exists uh, only online now. Yeah, online. Yeah. Oh, well, that doesn't count. That's not like a real magazine. Yeah, but it's, it's not, it's not uh, in publication anymore. But uh, they used to put out those special... Starlog episode guide books where they compile the episode guides that they did in the magazines over the years. And I used to get all of those that they put out and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, Starlog, I read every episode of what happened and it really sounded so much better written that way in a book, in a paragraph. <laughs> Man, it was always a dream of something you'll never see. And yet here we are in this DVD age, all these classic shows, you know, being released. Well, I think that's about it. Unless you guys have anything else that you would like to point out about good, bad, indifferent, or intolerable about Star Lost Episode 2, Lazarus from the Mist. By the way, I think we never mentioned the episode title. No, I think it no, was you did. Well you mentioned, yeah, I mentioned it at the beginning. Um, the one thing that has left me with complete and abject horror did not actually happen in the context, in the contents of, of, of the episode, but rather what came at the end, and that was a preview for the next Star Lost episode. Oh, is that the one with John Colicos? With John Colicos. The and, real and, Baltar from the real Battlestar Galactica, John Colicos? <laughs> That's right. The real Commander Kor, the Klingon from Star Trek, the real Baltar, all those things. Yes, that's the that's the story where all the dome only has men in it for hundreds of years. Mm-hmm. Somehow, <laughs> <laughs> everybody study up on parthenogenesis. <laughs> <laughs> so next time is not going to be the Star Lost. Next time we're going to do a special episode on. BBC 4's new H.G. Wells's War, uh, not War of the Worlds. <laughs> First man in the earth, in the moon. <laughs> <laughs> would you, First man in the moon. Would you like to make up a title for it too, Ben, yes. just to get us all going? <laughs> uh, no, you guys, you guys uh, I, I'm, I'm just having a great time listening to the two of you. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll be back looking at that. That's, that's a hotly anticipated uh Adaptation by Mark Gaddis, who was uh, uh, probably best known by the people who listen to this podcast uh, as writer of several Doctor Who episodes, some good ones, some bad ones, um, starred in an episode of Doctor Who that had Lazarus in the title, didn't it? Yes, it did. Well, there we go. That. That's the tie-in. That is creepy, really. Uh, that that can't be coincidence, <laughs> and that will. But be... at least, but at least we get to review something that is of, uh, hopefully, of some pretty good quality. Well, I'm certainly have my uh, I have my anticipation. He was also I should point out he was also the uh, co-creator of the new series of Sherlock, which is absolutely brilliant. And uh, between he and, and Stephen Moffat, and, and that series is brilliant, and it is 
so clear that they love Sherlock Holmes to death. I mean, it, you know, it's it's such a living, uh, a loving tribute to Sherlock Holmes, and I know that Mark Gaddis is, has a similar attitude towards the uh, the H. G. Wells classic. So I'm really hoping that he's uh, he's poured it all into this one. So, David, thank you for being here. You're welcome. Thanks for having me back. Uh, you're welcome. And uh, if anyone wants to, you know, thank David, you can send us feedback here. Uh, because without him, you wouldn't be listening to us talking about the Star Lost. <laughs> <laughs> send all your rotten tomatoes to I hate that comic book boy at <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, Ben, thank you. Uh, glad to have you back on the show after last oh, week's... Uh, nice to be back. Absence. Yes. And we will uh, see you all soon. Next time on Fusion Patrol. Cheers. You've been listening to the Fusion Patrol podcast. We'd love to hear from you. You can reach us at feedback at fusionpatrol.com, or you can follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash fusionpatrol, or look for us on Facebook. Fusion Patrol is a production of Lone Locust Productions. Our theme music is Fight the Future by Amber Wolf. Pip, pip, total squeak.